Excellencies, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, um, good morning, everyone. Very well, welcome to everyone who's joining us online to attend this webinar um, on the, the Mediterranean diet and agricultural heritage. My name is Ituni Uldada. I'm the Deputy Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity and Environment at FAO. And it is my great pleasure to moderate this opening session. Um, this webinar is organized with the Italian permanent representation to FAO and the Secretariat of the Global Important Agricultural Heritage System, GIS. And in this webinar, we will explore uh, the potential synergies between the Global Important Agricultural Heritage Systems the International Alliance for the Promotion of the Principles of the Mediterranean Diet and other healthy traditional diets around the world. So I would like to thank everyone and all the speakers and the moderators who are joining us today for this important event. And let me just set the scene very briefly, just to say that as part of the in initiative, the Mediterranean Diet Principles for the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development, this webinar, the aim of this webinar is to identify potential synergies and mutual benefits regarding the health, sustainable diet and agricultural heritage. And doing this in two kinds of ways. On one hand, by raising awareness of the international relevance of the GIS program to food culture, the preservation of food systems and diets. And on the other hand, by sharing experiences and innovative solutions also for the post COVID-19 pandemic era. And although, as you can see in the webinar, we're referring to the Mediterranean area, in fact, the webinar intends to go beyond this geographical area and to look at the linkages between the GIS and healthy diets also in other regions of, of the world. So traditional diets like the Mediterranean ones have always shown really a strong character of resilience and ability to adapt to new conditions, as well as the extreme link with the respective territories, cultures, and agricultural landscapes. So the traditional diets are really an integral part of our heritage of food systems, and they're absolutely key for preservation. So without much ado, let me just explain a couple of technical points before I introduce our speakers for this opening session. Um, Interpretation for different languages is available for Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Russian, Spanish, Italian, and Japanese. So as usual, please just go to the globe icon at the right bottom of the screen and you can choose the language you want there. And after the webinar, all the presentations, all the material will be made available on the GIS website. So please go there and visit it and, and use the, the material that you're interested in. So now it's really my great pleasure to, to move on into this opening session. And we're very honored, very delighted to have with us uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Vincenza Lomonaco, who's the ambassador of the Italian permanent representation to FAO. Ambassador, we're so delighted to have you with us. I know you're very passionate about this topic and we're here to work with you and it's a pleasure. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very kind words that um, you spoke. I'm going to be very brief and concise because today I think the experts need to take the floor and speak. First of all, I wish to welcome all of our colleagues, our friends from FAO, the professors and faculty who are connected remotely, and all the experts who have um, followed us and organized this webinar with us. This webinar, as you rightly said, was organized by the permanent representative of our representation of Italy at um, the um, Rome-based um, 
agencies and together with the FAO, of course. And um, I would say that uh, um, it um, coincides with a very special time. 2021 is the year of the Italian presidency of the G20 and Italy's co-chair or co-presidency of COP26 and uh, the Rome pre-summit and the UN Food Systems Summit. And uh, in Rome, in the fall of this very year, 2021, we will host uh, the International Conference on Biodiversity in Agriculture. The ABD Congress. In the context uh, of these very important events, this uh, representation is strongly committed to uh, supporting the discussions underway, both nationally and internationally. And these discussions and debates are uh, endeavoring to guarantee food security for all. They are endeavoring to also respond to the challenges posed by the pandemic to food systems. And uh, in uh, broader terms, to achieve the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals of Agenda 2030. We are therefore continuing to organize all these events and, and thanks to the very valuable contribution of FAO. Especially we're focusing on these uh, uh, days that we have devoted to the study and promotion of uh, Mediterranean diet and uh, the other healthy and traditional diets uh, within the initiative Mediterranean Diets Principles for the Agenda 2030. This is an, initi an initiative which, as you rightly said, goes well beyond the Mediterranean itself because it embraces all countries throughout the world. As many of you will recall, this uh, representation between 2019 and 2020 organized uh, seven thematic days uh, in order to raise uh, awareness of the uh, countries that are members uh, of the Rome-based agencies, as well as um, stakeholders, the uh, public at large uh, and other interested parties, on how it is that Mediterranean diet and other healthy and traditional diets can contribute to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals of Agenda 2030. Now, there was great interest elicited by these initiatives, and that's why today we've decided to organize yet another day in collaboration with FAO and in coordination with the Ministry of Health. Today, we are going to devote our attention to flavors, local flavors, um, that are part of uh, the FAO GS, uh, the Globally Important Agricultural Heritage Systems, the aim of which is to identify and protect uh, extremely um, important uh, global agricultural systems and food. Our goal is to highlight, thanks to the presence of Italian and international experts, who, by the way, I'd like to thank warmly for accepting our invitation. I was saying our aim is to highlight the link between agricultural production sites and uh, products that derive uh, from that land, uh, and not just uh, those products that make up the Mediterranean diet, but others too. A special focus shall be placed uh, on uh, the GHAS sites uh, in the Mediterranean, which are the custodians of knowledge and know-how that have made it possible to develop extremely important global agricultural systems that are capable of protecting agrobiodiversity and ecosystems, foster local food production, support the well-being of farmers, defend landscapes, support appropriate food habits or eating habits and nutrition, and preserve uh, an amazing panoply of local traditions that have a great historic and cultural meaning. With today's event, we also wish to welcome Japan in this alliance 
uh, for the promotion of the principles of Mediterranean diet and other healthy traditional diets, promoted by this uh, representation back in 2019, and uh, which sees the participation of about 20 countries from the Mediterranean area and beyond. Japan, together with China, is one of the main champions and supporters of GS. And the speaker from Japan today will actually highlight the link between Japan, um, the Japan's sites and traditional diet. Um, I'm also very proud of something else. Professor Pizzana, who is uh, the um, director of the clinic of the National Clinical Facility on Nutrition in the city of Turin, will be able to present the uh, scientific dossier on the Mediterranean diet, which was developed uh, within the UN Decade Project on Nutrition. He will highlight uh, the uh, sustainable and healthy diet model as uh, an important tool to prevent non-communicable diseases. This is a document and a tool that Italy intends to enhance uh, also in the context of the upcoming UN Food System Summit to promote and protect the Italian agri-food model in terms of sustainability and health of individuals and of the planet. This is a most recent scientific study available on the many benefits provided by the Mediterranean diets and other healthy diets, which is developed by a team of uh, experts and researchers coordinated by Professor Pezzana himself in collaboration with the Ministry of Health, which today is represented by the Diplomatic Council of the Minister of Her Health. I now would like to give the floor to our speakers who certainly have a lot more to say than I do. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador. This has been a really very important introduction, and you set the scene very nicely. And I would like to thank you for your leadership in, in this area and wish the Italian presidency really good luck with the G20, with preparations for the pre-COP and COP26. I'm sure you will do very well, and we're with you to help you and support you on that. Um, and as you said, this is time for international experts as well to tell us more about the evidence, about the importance of um, traditional diet and traditional um, heritage and the focus on GIS sites, as, as, as you said. Um, and when you mentioned that today the attention will be on local flavor, you reminded me, Ambassador, two years ago when we had this event. What we're missing now is when we finished that event, we had the pleasure to taste the Mediterranean food, the variety of Mediterranean food. So we're going to miss this virtually. And I think to bring people really closer to the food and what it means. So I hope we'll have another opportunity to, to have that where we can actually really taste that, you know, beauty and tasty food. Thank you very much, Deputy Director. We will, don't worry. We will do it in presence in tasting Thanks, the food. Thank you. <laughs> Really looking forward to that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now it gives me great pleasure to invite His Excellency Davide La Cecilia, uh, who is Minister Plenipotentiary, Ministry of, Environment, of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of Italy. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Director General. Thank you, Vincenza, for uh, this initiative. Uh, I... On behalf of the Minister of Health, Roberto Speranza, I wish to thank FAO and our representation, of course, for having organized this special day um, that is devoted to the Mediterranean diet within the context of the initiative known as Mediterranean Diets Principles for Agenda 2030. This is a great opportunity to draw attention to the Mediterranean diet and its potential, which were recognized globally with the inclusion by um, UNESCO in its um, global heritage, uh, cultural heritage. Uh, we know that, um, unfortunately, one death out of five uh, is because of poor quality of diet. Uh, we know that, uh, and there are problems uh, um, 
related to undernutrition, malnutrition, and overnutrition that we find not just in the same population, but also in the same individual. And this is a, a factor uh, that unfortunately has taken the, pl the place of um, veritable scourges for, for public health throughout the world, like malaria, TB, and measles. And I think that this is especially true also in this COVID era. And uh, the Italian presidency of the G20 intends to place special emphasis on how to better prepare for pandemics in the future. And uh, it will place a special focus on the food systems and how um, a healthy nutritional environment and appropriate eating habits, not just what we eat, but how we eat it and how we share our food with others, how all this can contribute to reinforcing um, our resilience vis-a-vis -vis disease. In this context, the Mediterranean diet as a tradi traditional and sustainable diet plays a fundamental role in preventing non-communicable diseases by reducing obesity, uh, overweight, uh, by promoting sustainability, protecting biodiversity, reducing pollution, improving food production, and uh, by limiting food waste uh, and fostering food security. And this is, has a pretty big impact on several sustainable development goals. Today, as uh, the ambassador said, we're not just going to talk about the Mediterranean diet, but all of the healthy traditional diets that are related to our land, that are the custodians of know-how, and that have made it possible um, to protect uh, agrobiodiversity, ecosystems, uh, and foster uh, production that is uh, very local, and that, that's made it possible to um, support the well-being of farmers, defend landscapes, and support appropriate nutrition, which uh, will make it possible to retain and conserve an incredible legacy of local traditions of great historic and cultural meaning. I too would like to mention now the very important study carried out by Professor Andrea Pizzana within the framework of the UN Decade Project on Nutrition, which we will definitely be able to enhance at the UN Food Systems Summit so that we will be able to promote and uh, safeguard the model offered by these uh, traditional diets uh, and uh, guarantee the sustainability and health of individuals and planet because we know that uh, persons and planet are the themes of uh, uh, Italy's G20 um, in 2021. This is a study um, that was carried out, as I said, by Professor Pizzana with a team of experts in collaboration with the Ministry of Health. Uh, I'm very keen to listen to what he has to say, and I'd like to thank him and all of you for your kind attention. Well, thank you very much, Your Excellency um, Davide La Sicilia, and thank you for highlighting the, the health benefits of the Mediterranean diets, but also the broader healthy traditional diets, as, as you well explained, particularly the benefit not just for health, but also for protecting ecosystems and enhancing biodiversity, as well as supporting the well-being of farmers and providing nutritious values to, to consumers. And, and also your point on, on the legacy of the local tradition that needs to be preserved and like all of us, as you said, we're looking for, forward to, to learning more about this study from uh, Professor Pizzana. So thank you very much for um, continuing with the setting the scenes. And um, now, Excellencies, dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the, the GIS Secretariat is hosted in, in FAO within the Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity and Environment which is linked to the overall and the broader agenda of climate change, biodiversity and environment. Uh, and it is my great pleasure now to invite Mr. Eduardo Monsor, who is the director of uh, the Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity and Environment, to say a few words in this opening session. Eduardo, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Truly, Your Excellencies, dear Ambassador, 
It's a great pleasure on behalf of FAO to welcome this initiative of the uh, Italian representation in FAO uh, to organize the excellent and timely uh, webinar on the Mediterranean diets, the principles for Agenda 2030. Um, as you, my colleague Zituni, the Deputy Director of the Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity and Environment mentioned, um, we, we host the, the GIA Secretariat at OCB, and we are very pleased to have it in FAO because the, the Global Important Agricultural Heritage Systems offer the, the knowledge base for all the innovation we need now to promote a sustainable agriculture. Um, it's, um, it's a living laboratory that has been developed based on the traditional knowledge that will bring to us the opportunity to address what Ambassador La Cecilia just mentioned, uh, the link between health, nutrition, and the environment. And uh, we welcome the way that this uh, webinar is approaching in the framework of what we call the super year for nature. 2021 is the year where we are going to have the UN Food Summit, is uh, the year where we are going to have the CBD COP15 in Kunming, the, 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 uh, um, the, the pre-COP of the summit here in Rome, the, um, the co-presidency of uh, Italy and UK on the COP of the climate that will be held in Glasgow in November. It's a year that we are all debating how we are going to build a better planet. And uh, uh, at the same time, going through this pandemic that has been very tragic for most for many families and tragic for the economy. We know that the recovery, we only, the best tool we have for the recovery is a, a healthy um, environment and a healthy life. Nutrition is essential for that, for recognize this importance uh, and uh, is events like this that put the elements for us to have action on the table for combating the pandemic with healthy lives. Uh, the Mediterranean uh, diets have certain responses that have to be learned to all. So I would like to, to close just by uh, welcoming in, uh, the, the initiative that has been put to us through the Italian representation uh, in FAO, saying that uh, we are very honored to participate, to provide the, 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 the elements, the, by, the basis for the the GIA Secretariat to operate, and um, the moment that we have just approved the new FAO strategy on nutrition that has been endorsed uh, by the FAO Council a few weeks ago uh, shows this event as one of the, the steps moving ahead on the implementation of this strategy. It's action on the ground, and I would like to congratulate for the organization press, presence of about 200 participants in this event and we are here to serve. Thank you very much, Your Excellencies. Thank you very much, and back to you, uh, dear Zituni. Well, thanks very much, dear Eduardo. That sets the scene also very nicely by you know, reminding us of the broader context of the importance of having a healthy environment and healthy life if we want to recover in a healthy way from, from the the pandemic. So thanks very much for that. And thank you for also reminding us of the um, FAO strategy on nutrition, which is very much relevant to our discussion and our event today and where that um, fits in. Um, so for this opening session, I would like to, to thank all the three speakers, Your Excellency Ambassador Le Monaco, Your Excellency La Sicilia and, and dear Eduardo, for opening this session and setting the scene for the next phase of, of this event. So now it gives me a great pleasure to, to hand over to Mr. Yushi Haidu, uh, Andu, who is GIS coordinator, and he will introduce and moderate the next session of this webinar, which will be dedicated to the local food systems, sustainable diet, and food culture. So Mr. Andu San, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mansu and Zituni, for your nice introduction. And thank you again, once again, to Ambassador Lokonos and the Italian Embassy and the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs for supporting this event 
And also I extend my thanks to all the speakers and moderators from many countries. Due to lack of time, I must immediately start the next session. And in this session, we have five speakers, and this is a comprehensive uh, session to introduce what is a Mediterranean diet, and what is a GS, and how the Mediterranean diet and GS is synergy and uh, connection, and how the uh, consumer's behavior and dietary pattern impact the production and sustainability and all about. So let us let me start my presentation. Just let me have some time to share the screen. I hope you can see the screen. Yes? Then let yes. me start. Yes, thank you. Okay, this is a general information GS, and this slide we would like to focus on the selection criteria here. And uh, yes. And GS is nominated based on these five criteria, and one of the criteria is cultures. And this culture includes traditional food cultures. Recently, more proposal, a GS proposal includes their own culture cuisine in their proposal document. And here we have a, a, a all number of GS sites in all over the world. We have 62 GS sites in 22 countries now. These are examples of GS site. I don't have uh, time to explain in detail, but you can see wide variation of agriculture types, harvest and adapted to the, their different environment. Next time, if we have enough time, I introduce each detail of, of this GS site. And this slide to, is to illustrate the entire GS designation process. The designation process of GS starts from proposal making by member countries. An action plan must be included in the proposal document. And after the GS is designated, GS sites should implement action plan for dynamic conservation by conducting several measures and activities of action plan. We expect that the combination of all the outcomes of these actions will contribute to conservation and development of the site. This is the purpose of GS program. Recently, global discussion on healthy diets and sustainable agriculture or sustainable food system have created a new concept, namely uh, sustainable healthy diets. FAO WHO Nutrition Conference in 2014 pointed out the environmental degradation, as well as unsustainable production and consumption patterns as the constraints faced by current food system. Based on this recognition, FAO WHO expert consultation in 2019 agreed on the term of sustainable healthy diets as a dietary pattern which not only promotes consumers' health, but also have low environmental pressure and impact and are culturally acceptable. Now, diet is viewed from its environmental impact in the production side and connected with cultures. Here, I would like to explain the purpose of this webinar, which is very important. Now, more attention is attractive than ever to the impact of diet on the production side. Like GS achieved, Sustainable agriculture through their unique features in the production side, specific types of diets, in particular, when they are based on traditional and the culture and strengthened with its connection to local production, can also contribute to sustainable agriculture and sustainable food system. One of the prominent examples of such healthy diets based on tradition and culture is the Mediterranean diet. The purpose of this seminar is to review the healthy dietary patterns based on tradition and culture in Mediterranean region, as well as in other countries like Japan and China, and to learn 
how these diets can contribute to promotion of health and sustainable agriculture. And based on this analysis and recognition and studies, finally to explore the way to use the traditional food culture in the GIS site as an effective tool for promoting sustainability of GIS agriculture. So these are the objectives of seminars. And I'd like to expect that the fruitful discussion will take place and uh, this will be a very useful seminar to all of us. And thank you very much for your attention. So this concludes my presentation. Then I have to give floor to the next speaker. Next speaker is uh, Ms. Florence Parkanak. She has been working in an FAO, Rome, since 2001 for such subject as sustainable value chain development and inclusive business model, voluntary standards and geographic indications. Please, Ms. Tatonak, the floor is yours. You have 10 minutes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Ando, and thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this uh, very in interesting uh, webinar and actually uh, to represent, uh, let's say, the, the nutrition side of, uh, of uh, the, the topic. And I, I am happy to, to hear uh, Mr. Siutuni and uh, Eduardo also mentioning the nutrition strategy of FAO, which we collaborate in. So uh, I, I, will, uh, I will try to, to put uh, the scene for, for the topic, which is actually very interesting. Um, Maybe starting with uh, the basics, so going back to uh, the 2030 Agenda, which offers a vision for food and agriculture as enablers for sustainable development, and um, looking at uh, the need for uh, really taking a food system approach to achieve uh, the SDGs. Uh, then also looking at the definitions of food system. So I will I will not go to, through all uh, these uh, these definitions, but just to um, to highlight that there is really a need for to realize the SDGs uh, for food systems to be reshaped to be more inclusive of poor and marginalized population, more productive, environmentally sustainable and resilient and able to deliver healthy diets to all. And when we look at the food system, uh, so sorry for this very complicated uh, diagram, but you may know it already, it's a food system framework from the HL HLP, uh, um, from the CFS, uh, looking at the link between uh, the different uh, pieces of the food system uh, starting from the food supply chain on the left. Uh, and uh, we can understand that when we influence uh, the, the, this part of the food supply chain and stimulate the supply of diversified and nutritious food, we influence also uh, the other part. Uh, also looking at the food environment uh, by improving availability and accessibility for nutritious food, because it's not enough to, to, uh, to produce enough food, but you also need uh, people to be able to, to, to buy them and to access to them, and uh, to lead to the consumer behavior and increasing the demand of diversified nutritious food, where we uh, arriving then to, to the diet, which is, let's say, the objective uh, of, uh, of the webinar to link with uh, with, in particular, healthy diets. So, it's also important to say that there is not one food system. There are multiple food systems around the world. And uh, one specific, like what kind of specific food system are traditional food systems? And it's, uh, the, these traditional food systems are very diverse. They are embedded in unique historical, religious, social, cultural, and economic context. And the healthy diets are therefore shaped by the way 
So food is produced, procured, distributed, marketed, chosen, prepared, and consumed. And the social and cultural aspects and the economic impact of the food and the food system must be taken into account in the dialogue on the responses to improve the diets. So I will not go back to the concept of sustainable healthy diet that Mr. Endo already uh, highlighted in his uh, previous presentation, but uh, you could uh, refer to, to this uh, the FAO WSU publication to, to have more details about it. So now I would like to, to take the example of uh, the Mediterranean diet to, to highlight all of the feature, features that I was talking about. So the Mediterranean diet could, is considered as a territorial diet that has its roots in the history of the Mediterranean Sea and its region that was for centuries a meeting point and also a melting pot for different cultures and civilizations. The traditional Mediterranean diet was defined originally as a diet with high consumption of whole cereals, legumes, vegetables, fruits, nuts, and olive oil, a low to middle consumption of dairy products, and a low consumption of meat and poultry. We can also mention that in uh, uh, 2010, UNESCO, added the Mediterranean diet to its, its list of intangible cultural heritage of humanity, not only because of its nutritional attributes, but also because of it being a way of life that encompasses a set of skills, knowledge, practices, and traditions from landscape to table, including crops, harvesting, fishing, conservation, processing, preparation, and in particular, food consumption. So we re really see the, the systemic component of, of this kind of approaches. We've served the example also of the Mediterranean diet. Uh, I understand there will be a, a further presentation about uh, the health benefits of the Mediterranean diet. So I will maybe not go too much into the details, but uh, there are a lot of uh, scientific studies uh, highlighting the uh, Mediterranean diet and the positive health outcomes. Uh, for example, the reduction in total mortality, uh, reduction in mortality for, from cardiovascular disease and cancer, and with cancer risk lowering potential, and the favorable influences of Mediterranean diet on the risk of, for obesity, uh, type 2 diabetes, cancer, and neurodegenerative diseases. But what is interesting is to see the link between the Mediterranean diet and the traditional food system that is uh, going with it. Even if we, we can even say there is not one traditional food system around the Mediterranean diet, because despite of its consistency of time and space, the Mediterranean diet was shaped by the specificity of its local context and manifested itself in different local versions around uh, the Mediterranean, reflecting the diversity of local food systems, also and also cultural context across the countries while overall pre preserving the main characteristic of the traditional Mediterranean diet. And, and to finalize, I will just would like to highlight uh, 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 different tools for the Mediterranean di diet and how to use it as a driver for sustainable development. So Mr. Ando already introduced the concept of, of GIAS, you know, the Global Important Agricultural Heritage System. But I would like also to, um, to highlight the importance of a tool like a geographical indication, which is a tool to um, uh, uh, assign to link uh, and to, to identify a product and, uh, with a quality linked to the origin and geographical origin. And we can see that uh, there is a similar approach with the preservation and 
promotion of agriculture and food heritage in a specific location and territory to contribute to more sustainable development. And these approaches, they both value identity, culture, local knowledge, uh, but also biodiversity, for example, with specific races and, and uh, breeds, particular agroecological characteristics in relation with the knowledge, which is related with uh, the uh, approach of terroir in, in, in uh, geographical indication uh, terminology, and the territory and its community of local actors to lead to uh, territorial strategy. It's very important to uh, uh, involve also producers and producer organization in these uh, territorial processes. So they both offer conservation in situ of local biological and cultural resources, official recognition and link to self-esteem for producers, which is very important for them to, to uh, have their products and their way of living recognized and also public-private coordination. So I saw in the program that there will be a, a more uh, detailed presentation on, on uh, this uh, example from Italy, where we see the link between a GIAS, so in this case, the olive grove of the slopes between Assisi and Spoleto, and the GI product, which is in this case, uh, olive oil produced in the area which is a, a geographical indication of the denomination of origin um, uh, uh, DOP in, in Italy, certifying the high quality of the product and ensuring a specific way of cultivation and processing. So finally, I just would like to highlight some uh, uh, complementary uh, approaches and synergies between uh, GI, geographical indication, uh, that can bring to GIS, mainly the contribution to a better val valorization and preservation of typical product from Mediterranean diet, also to strengthen the market dimension and to ensure the future of local, the local production, maintaining activity and employment and reducing Poverty. It's it's always important to link uh, the, the the component of sustainability, you know, the economical, uh, with the social and uh, uh, the environmental uh, uh, way. So I will not go through all, all the list of, of synergies and benefits, but uh, I really see some uh, uh, good synergies and also um, between the policies and as incentives between agriculture, rural development, intellectual property, environment, culture, and tourism. And actually, I just wanted to highlight one publication that we, we did uh, jointly with uh, GS about uh, geographical indication and uh, so slow, food, slow food presidia. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Patmak. Uh, thank you for your very comprehensive presentation, which touch upon the all aspects of the Mediterranean diet and its implications and multifaceted nature, multifaceted nature of the Mediterranean diets, which can connect to the diet, dietary pattern to production, sustainability, as well as social and uh, economic aspect, as well as GS and GIs, which have the common objectives with Mediterranean diets. Thank you very much. Now, uh, next speaker is Professor Andrea Pezzan. As we were introduced in the opening remarks, he is a professor in different prestigious public and private universities in Italy. He also holds a scientific production of over 200 scientific articles. At the moment, he is director of Clinical Nutrition Unit at Azienza Sanitaria Città di Torino. Uh, I'd like to introduce the professor's uh, presentation by asking his question, such as that, uh, which are the countries that have expressed their interest in scientifically comparing different models of this traditional healthy and sustainable diets? Professor Pezzan, you have 
It's a pity, just five minutes. Next time, please extend more time. You have five minutes for presentation. Please, Professor. Buongiorno a tutti. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank the moderator, whose question I'll answer immediately, but um, please let me open with um, a heartfelt thanks to Ambassador Vincenzo Lomonaco and the uh, diplomatic uh, counselor Davide La Cicilia for presenting my work, which is the result of uh, a large uh, team uh, whom I am only representing right now. I appreciate and admire your question because it enables us uh, to actually set the scene for the document. The scope of the document is very broad. It's uh, only a part of a longer journey. It's not a, an arrival. And in this journey, we're interested not only in engaging in exchanges with countries that are part of UNESCO and that are committed to the Mediterranean diet, but with other countries, with academia and associations that scientifically devote attention to the issues that are dear to our heart. Um, the a whole question of the Mediterranean diet as a traditional, healthy, and sustainable model has seen great work between us and countries like the U.S., the Netherlands, Morocco, Greece, Lebanon, and others. And we really do hope that this may become an agora, that is a, a venue of aggregation in which we can continue to exchange our views and experiences and build scenarios of global one health so as to provide a gain, gain situation for individuals and the planet at large. Um, now, specifically, this is a document, this is a table of content, the index, which shows you the various steps of our work. Essentially, we very strongly espoused uh, the uh, UN Decade for Nutrition and uh, the a triple burden of malnutrition is something that provides us with a perfect point of departure for our work. Let's not forget that what we're learning from uh, the pandemic and this whole tragedy has helped us to understand that uh, although nutrition has not influenced uh, contagions and contamination, once contamination has occurred, um, the presence of one of the three forms uh, of uh, um, undernutrition, malnutrition, or the deficiency of uh, uh, micronutrients are responsible um, for poor health and the price to be paid by the individual is way too high. That's why we must uh, engage in prevention measures on this front. There's a price, of course, for uh, the planet, for human beings, and even for the animal species. And uh, there's a price to be paid for future generations. So this is one um, of... Uh, the parts, one of the steps I analyzed in this part of the book, uh, which has to do um, the triple burden, the price for the planet, uh, um, the animal kingdom, uh, the uh, contamination of water and soil and land, uh, and then, of course, uh, the lack of or loss of biodiversity. So we start with a multicultural and multi-territorial perspective, and in so doing, we develop this circular model, which is very important to us because it's part of a trans generational perspective in which we've tried to include the four uh, benefits of sustainable diet, uh, health, the environment, society and culture, and the economy, um, going beyond the One Health approach in the endeavor to work on all possible fronts. So, going back to the very appropriate definition of FAO of sustainable diet based on the food policies proposed by FAO, we came to define a, a Mediterranean diet pattern based, of course, on the evidence already available in the literature and perhaps emphasized by a number of aspects. For example, 
we reflected on the role of fibers, of fermented food, the role of seasonality, which can actually um, be compared with other traditional diets with which we could uh, engage in uh, by um, promoting parallel work and studies. So the four benefits are analyzed in dedicated chapters of this um, study where we've included uh, daily life uh, and the territorial scope and uh, the importance of uh, retrieving traditions. Let me conclude in the interest of time by saying that our working group tried, of course, to uh, focus uh, and promote our approach, our vision. Um, we had very young students uh, studying nutrition who gave a contribution along with senior um, researchers. And uh, together, um, they contributed to this study. Of course, along with the Ministry for Health and the Higher Health Institute, which really helped us out um, in this endeavor. This was a very fruitful mix of experience and uh, freshness. and. Uh, it basically conveys our message, which is that the future of sustainable and healthy diet lies in a fine balance between tradition and innovation. Tradition needs to be conveyed and passed on as legacy. Innovation, provided that it doesn't disrupt the environment and provided that it helps us to achieve the SDGs, must be supported carefully in relation to the messages of tradition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Pezzana. Your dialogue gives us some uh, insights to develop some simple uh, diagram to let us fully understand the connection between nutritional aspect and sustainability, also as well as social impact of the one type of dietary pattern. Very instructive and uh, useful presentation. Thank you very much once again. So next speaker is uh, from Japan. His name is Masayuki Okuda. He's a famous chef in Japan, specialized in Italian cuisine. And based on his philosophy, namely locally produced, locally consumed, he has been actively working to collect his restaurant menu and production of rare local traditional varieties, and revitalizing farmers and their traditional knowledge. Over the last 20 years, he has revised several famous awards, both in Japan and abroad. Recently, he has been awarded by the Japanese Culture Agency for his continuous commitment to promoting traditional vegetables and their conservation. <laughs> では、ご覧ください。それでは、よろしくお願いします。遠藤です。はい、よろしくお願いします。はい。はい。えっと、ご挨拶。はい。えっと、私は日本の中の北にある、え、鶴岡市と。Thank you. I um a restaurateur who owns a restaurant in the north of Japan, Kichano Restaurant. And I have a number of restaurants and shops in Japan. And I've worked in 13 countries in the field. And in my main um, restaurant, I specialize in Italian cuisine with uh, speciali specialization in vegetables, and you can see some of these on the screen. And I try to use local ingredients in these dishes. May I first introduce the Shonai area in which uh, the restaurant is located. In the winter, the mountains are covered in snow in the northern part of Japan, as you can see on this picture. And then in spring, the snow thaws and melts, 
and it uh, has the effect of resetting the soil. Here you can see the um, molten snow in the rice paddies, and this is a panoramic view of the Shonai area. The two main towns are Tsuroka and Sakata. Uh, the, the area is surrounded by mountains on three sides, and it's very difficult to gain access to it, which has helped to make its um, culture unique. And there are five types of ocean with different characteristics. Some of the sea areas uh, contain um, thaw water, and so there are very varied marine ingredients. There are also different types of rivers. So there are 40 freshwater fish types as well as shellfish. There are also uh, very many uh, types of fruit and vegetable vegetables which are not particularly resilient to snow, but nonetheless many vegetables uh, are grown here and we also bring in others from abroad. And you should bear in mind that the temperature deviation, the range during the day is very high given the varied altitude within the region. And the seasons are very distinct in Shonai. This is the spring. And of course, such discrete uh, seasons allow for very varied products. In spring, we have uh, wild mountain vegetables. and wild herbs. We, will, we also have bamboo shoots above 1,000 meters altitude. We also have cherry salmon near the sea. Of course, they come up the rivers in the summer. You'll also find the edamame king, uh, the dadajamame, which are the best beans in the world, it's felt, as well as oysters which are specific to the region. And these oysters are in an area where the snow thaws, and they're thought to be the best oysters in Japan, Egawaki oysters. They also have um, uh, the rice, Japanese rice, Shonai rice in particular, and then Mote Giku, which are edible chrysanthemum flowers, and of course uh, a wide variety of fruit. And then in winter you have different fish which can only survive in very uh, cold areas, for example uh, cod, kandara, cod. And this is a calendar which I've uh, created and I wish to show you. You can see all the different ingredients available uh, for each specific season. You'll see the date and then you follow it all the way through the various ingredients in the fields, in the seas and then the types of dish which you can uh, concoct from those different varieties. So my cuisine expresses this uh, uh, wealth of variety uh, produced in Shonai in just one dish. And many occupations have historically coexisted in this region, which has produced a very diverse food culture. For example, here you have an example of religious cuisine. You could call it Japanese veganism. Veganism, it's called shojin cuisine, eaten by the Buddhist monks. And there is no animal origin ingredient in any of this food. 
You then have a cuisine which is specific to the farmers. Then you have a cuisine which is uh, specific to the fishers, the fisher folk in the region. And then you have a lot of visitors coming in by boat and to host these visitors we've developed what we call haute cuisine, high class cuisine and all of these cuisines have been um, preserved as local gastronomy and Shonai is therefore a very uh, rich area in terms of food but uh, it was not very well known until recently. And this brings me to the main uh, issue of my presentation, what we call heirloom vegetables, uh, living cultural heritage, if you like. Mm -hmm. These are vegetables cultivated down through several generations in a given area, picked and planted by hand by the farmers themselves, and they are used for uh, specific um, festivals or rituals. So these are the criteria which uh, allow us to describe them as heirloom vegetables, heritage vegetables. Now, if you look at this map, the orange lines are the main transportation routes, and in green you have the area connected to the markets in the major cities, such as Tokyo, via this network. And in the green areas, the farmers um, have given pride of place to vegetables that are easy to grow with strong demand for them. And you have the blue area in uh, on the map, which, which is my area, the Shonai area, it's very difficult to get good access to the big cities. And for this reason, traditional vegetables have been grown and eaten in the local area and preserved in this way. And here are some examples of these heirloom vegetables. There are 150 varieties in the Yamagata prefecture. Uh, including around 50 in Suruoka, where the Shonai region is located. Now, transposed to a map, you can see the list of these vegetables, and I'm going to introduce to you a few of them. So, here's an example of the Tonojima cucumber. Now, this can be uh, consumed uh, in various ways. It has uh, a rather rich, bitter aroma. It's astringent, but it has a round sweetness. You might say, um, why would you eat a bitter cucumber? But this helps you to whet your appetite, and it's good for curing the body from summer heat. And here's a dish with these characteristics. So it's a, a flounder fish, which um, was uh, dried. Uh, and then we've added this cucumber. And you have this very particular watery sensation and aroma added to the fish. Here are the Hirata red leeks. Now, what is pe peculiar about these leeks is that when they're cooked, they, be they become very soft and melt in the mouth uh, when uh, they can be quite acidic before they've been cooked. And they're very different to leeks uh, elsewhere. They're very sweet, but also um, tart and vinegary at the same time. And here's a dish I prepared. It's a hata hata fish, which has been boiled with this red leek which has been acidified using vinegar.
and it's a hot dish. And now you have a um, a masterpiece in our heirloom vegetables. We call it the snow vegetable in a particularly cold area of Yamagata Prefecture, and it's uh, unique. Uh, you grow it inside this in the snow, and it continues to grow in the snow. So it's a very um, particular, specific type of vegetable, and it's um, eaten during autumn and winter when vegetables are lacking. This is showing the wisdom of our ancestors. So they are sowed at the end of the at the end of August, beginning of September, and then they're covered with straw and soil while they grow in the snow. Now, the snow vegetable, the yokina, allows its own leaves to be uh, melted and this is going to produce heat and it will then be, that heat will be maintained because of the rice straw around it. So the snow vegetable breathes as such and it survived the winter cold and has absorbed the nutrients, becoming a beautiful white vegetable. And here's one of my dishes using the yukina snow vegetable. And I want the landscape of the region to be reflected in this dish. And to conclude, I'd like to present to you the Fuji sour turnip. Now, this is a vegetable which is difficult to grow, and as it's not um, very popular, it's um, a lot of people stop growing it. Um, and at one point, only one cup of seeds, seeds were left. But today, you have a whole mountainside covered, thanks to the renaissance, of uh, this turnip. And here's a dish sh showing the unique... Um, tartness and sweetness of the turnip. It's been presented on television and many people and many tourists have come to this region as a consequence. And a cartoon um, book for children and a movie have been screened uh, showcasing the Fujisawa turnip. And this has led to a consumption an increase in the consumption of it and the key to its success has been cooperation amongst these three key players the researchers or, or groups of players the researchers, the chefs and the farmers and of course I represent the chefs in this configuration the producers uh, give their produce to us the chefs we then adapt the produce for the customer and we're effectively advertising this produce as a consequence. Mm. Chefs can present uh, uh, their recipes in books, for example. The researchers have knowledge and social status, which uh, bolsters the status of the product pro produce. And this uh, three-way relationship has worked very well, making the Fujisawa turnip a great success. And our re restaurant has been made famous thanks to this dish. And many people have become talking about our Fujisawa turnip dish, which has uh, increased uh, the inflow of tourists in the region, thus providing uh, stability to us in our ability to, pro to supply these vegetables. And we've even been able to distribute them to restaurants elsewhere in Japan. And this has stabilised the income of... Uh, the local small-scale farmers producing rare products. They now have greater security. And this allows us to establish a, relation, a relationship of trust uh, amongst the various partners and stakeholders, which only strengthens the prospects for these vegetables. And this virtuous cycle has been possible because of this three-way cooperation between researchers farmers and chefs. And to conclude, in order to reinvigorate the local uh, agriculture and stakeholders, we've created a number of activities, making shonai 
the capital of gastronomy. And here are some of those activities. When I started my career in catering, um, we were talking about very large-scale activities. So um, there were very few small orders from restaurants, and the products as well were not conducive to convincing um, restaurants of the virtues of shonai vegetables. So I visited uh, producers frequently to exchange ideas, and I involved a number of stakeholders in this. I also turned to uh, local governments, and thus uh, shonai became more energised and galvanised, and it began to be recognised as a gastronomic capital. Its airport is now called Delicious Shonai Airport, and the city of Tsuroka in the region has also been, been designated by UNESCO as a creative city of gastronomy. It's the only Japanese city to have received this distinction, and it's now become the number one tourist destination in Yamagata prefect Prefecture with a threefold increase in foreign tourists and it's also been ranked as an ideal town to live in. And then a food train has also been created called Kairi and many people come from abroad to study our cuisine, particularly pe people coming in from Italy and through our gastronomy, Shona is now receiving many tourists. And to conclude, I'd like to say that farmers are part and parcel of the restaurants and the restaurants are part and parcel of the farming community. So this is a felicitous example which I wanted to give you. We're all united, as you can see in this photograph, working hand in hand in order to uh, galvanise my uh, restaurant, my team. They're all on this photo so this is a, a great example of how you can revive a rural area, at least in Japan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. This uh, uh, example shows that the importance of consumption and dietary pattern, which give great impact on the conservation of biodiversity, agrobiodiversity, and also his experience has, has uh, gave us some lessons learned that uh, supporting systems such as the combination with the academia, farmers, and demand people. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Mr. Okuda is an Italian chef, so who, who, um, he often comes to Italy. So when he comes the next time in Italy, I wish some, some meeting or collaboration work will be uh, carried out with Italian people, Italian side. And I'm also uh, Monaco and George san uh, why don't you visit this uh, restaurant when you visit Japan? And also I recommend uh, all the participants of the presenter to visit his restaurant when you visit Japan when the COVID-19 settled down. So I must proceed um, to the next speaker. Next speaker is Professor Bituari. He's a, he has a PhD in International Cooperation and Policy for Sustainable Development from University of Bologna. <clears throat> he has been a visiting researcher at several universities and research centers in Europe and the United States, including the Center for International Development at Harvard University. His interest is, his interest is, is in the sustainability of agriculture and rural policies and bioenergy and food waste. Please, Professor Vitu, you are expected to make a presentation on economic and environment and social sustainability in local food system. Please, you have 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rendo. And well, many thanks also to the Ambassador of Monaco who facilitated the participation to this uh, exciting uh, uh, workshop. Uh, well, it will be fairly difficult to... Uh, uh, to talk after the very fascinating presentation of uh, Mr. Okuda. Anyway, the, let's see, what we wanted to share today is uh, uh, see, something on uh, what we are doing and how uh, we see the challenge of assessing economic, environmental, and social sustainability in local food systems. I think that all the previous speakers uh, emphasized 
the complexity uh, which is laying behind uh, food system sustainability, which is a, a complex challenge that is characterized by, let's say, different layers uh, and dimensions that require the uh, complex solutions uh, and uh, assessment tools. And uh, I did like in particular the emphasis uh, or the, uh, let's say, uh, the, uh, the emphasis uh, uh, that Mr. Okuda made in the need for co-designing and engaging communities and different type of stakeholders in developing solutions and methods. So uh, that is something important. And also, since I'm working in the academia, uh, it is extremely important to go outside the academia in order to get uh, the outstanding knowledge that uh, it is produced also uh, outside the, let's say, scientific uh, environment. So... Uh, the uh, challenge of today is uh, uh, to ensure uh, food, sy food systems sustainability. As we have uh, emphasized this morning, there is not a single food system, so we should look at the sustainability of different and diverse food systems. And so the challenge is the provision of affordable, safe, and sustainable food, which is uh, uh, quite challenged today. And it is challenged by a number of causes, uh, including uh, globalization trend, population growth, the competition over resources, overconsumption and waste. Food waste is clearly uh, an important and uh, emerging challenge and climate, uh, and, and climate change as well. So these, let's say, challenges are leading to a number of consequences that include uh, the fact that consumers uh, are often losing the relationship with the food they are consuming. Uh, we have uh, used the concept of terroir, so they are losing uh, the link uh, between uh, the consumption, the food, the consumption, and, and the way food is, uh, is, uh, uh, is produced. An additional uh, uh, consequence is related to the fact that uh, the impacts uh, of food systems are fully delocalized. So it is a challenge to understand where the impacts are, uh, are located along food supply chains that are often uh, localized in different regions, in different countries. And a third consequence is related to the fact that food is uh, often seen as a, com uh, a commodity. So we are often talking about uh, the monetary value of food, potentially losing uh, the cultural value, the environmental value, the social value uh, of food. So that is something that is extremely important. And if we want to, uh, let's say, include uh, the components uh, and the dimension of food that are not related only to its monetary value, but also to the social, to the nutritional, to the, uh, to the uh, environmental uh, value uh, of food, we also should think about uh, instruments for assessing these, uh, let's say, additional dimensions that are not uh, always represented uh, in the cost that we pay, in the price that we pay for food. Uh, so the food system challenge is uh, getting more and more important because uh, uh, there are a number of imbalances and, and trade-offs that uh, we are facing within society. If we think about the food redistribution, ideally redistributing just the 1% of food production would be enough to feed all the hungry people. Obviously, there are logistical and organizational challenges that do not allow this, but this is emphasizing the inequalities that we have within food systems. Despite having food for all, uh, over 800 million people remain chronically undernourished. We, we are paying uh, important costs for obesity in many countries, in many regions within, uh, within countries. Uh, if we look at the European scale and we think about food waste, each European citizen is uh, wasting over 100 kilograms of food per year, over 130 kilograms of food per year, if we look uh, at the last uh, estimates. We have issues with uh, food mirages uh, and food deserts. So the sustainability 
of uh, food system is uh, challenged by uh, a number of elements uh, that need to be in, uh, taken into consideration. And uh, what we need are uh, holistic approaches, systemic uh, approaches that are allowing us uh, to combine and to look at sustainability within the different pillars. They're different pillars. But we need to have uh, and to develop methodologies that are allowing us uh, to understand uh, the trade-offs and the tensions between uh, the different dimensions uh, of uh, su sustainability. So moving from, uh, let's say, a more theoretical and global perspective to a more uh, operational one. Uh, in some of the work that we are doing, uh, at the moment, we are taking a city-region food system approach. And uh, so we are taking a, a, an approach that we believe it is uh, allowing to understand and to detect and to identify uh, the diversity of food systems. And uh, as a city region food systems, uh, taking the, the, uh, the, the definition of FAO uh, and uh, of Jennings, we are defining the complex network of actors, processes, and relationship uh, to, to do with food production processing, marketing, and consumption that exist in a given geographical region that include a more or less concentrated urban center and the surroundings. So meaning the peri-urban and, uh, and rural interland. So we are looking at uh, the stakeholders, uh, uh, everybody who is engaged in food production, processing, and consumption, the territory and the relations, and the relations between uh, these actors uh, within a given territory. And we are applying these... Uh, type of concept uh, to Europe uh, through, let's say, working uh, in different city and region settings, uh, looking not at, uh, uh, at region food systems only from, let's say, a macro, norm, a macro perspective, but also in a micro perspective. So we are looking at single initiatives that are allowing to understand uh, the diversity between them. And, uh, and we are trying to adopt these uh, concept uh, at the European scale within a project uh, uh, that is called Foodi, Food Systems uh, in European Cities. Uh, what we are doing within this project is, uh, uh, first of all, to try to define an operational methodology for understand how to assess the sustainability of systems. Uh, we are basing this methodology on uh, life, life cycle thinking uh, uh, approaches, so combining uh, life cycle assessment in order to understand environmental impacts, life cycle costing to understand the monetary and economic impacts, and social life cycle assessment to understand social impacts, including also health and nutrition that should be embedded in this dimension. And we want to do a number of other activities, including learning, uh, let's say, between different city region food systems, and what we want to do uh, is also to, let's say, start from this uh, small initiative in, in order to ensure that we are creating an impact. So we want to understand how to scale up uh, these initiatives, how to scale up uh, sustainability in order to create uh, an impact uh, in uh, larger food systems. And uh, so the focus on uh, our work is, uh, of our work is to uh, understand uh, how to develop uh, systems uh, and methodologies that are, allow are allowing the integration between social, economic, and environmental impacts. And uh, we are using, uh, we are uh, starting this work by identifying and using uh, uh, selected KPIs, so key performance indicators that uh, are allowing to target and, and to understand the different dimensions. If we look at the social one, we can include uh, uh, job, community, uh, food quality and safety. If we look at uh, uh, the economic one, uh, the uh, uh, organization uh, outlook, uh, local economic development, uh, consumers and users. Uh, if we look at the environmental one, uh, the use of resources, waste management, transport can be included. And uh, at the moment, we are looking how to include uh, health healthy and sustainable diets within the social, 
let's say, pillar of the work in order to include food safety, welfare, cost and sanitary services, eco-health in this type of methodology. It is a methodology that we are applying to different settings, that we are testing to different settings because we have already applied it to food waste, to natural, to natural resources. So what we are doing is also to understand how to tailor it to specific systems. And beside tailoring it to specific systems, what we are doing is also to try to ensure the understanding and the usability of this methodology for users that are not uh, expert in uh, using uh, life cycle thinking. Why? Because it is important to provide uh, operators and stakeholders at any stage of the food supply chain with the simplified systems uh, in order to understand the sustainability of the activities they are, they are carrying out. So the, aim, the final aim of this work is to develop uh, a simplified assessment tool, uh, say, basing on these uh, key performance indicators uh, in order to allow different stakeholders to have uh, a rapid appraisal about uh, the sustainability of the activities they are performing. And this should allow them to have uh, a clear idea about uh, the hotspots for improvement in terms of how to maximize uh, social benefits, how to minimize uh, uh, environmental uh, externalities, and eventually to run, let's say, more uh, full-scale or complex type of uh, uh, assessment if they want to focus on a, on a single uh, type of uh, um, type of uh, uh, hotspot. Uh, and going even more in the detail, uh, we have uh, discussed about diets, uh, the Mediterranean diet. Uh, sustainability. And so one example of potential, let's say, uh, initiative at the city region food system level uh, is represented by school canteens that are clearly an important setting to understand healthy diets, sustainable diets, and how to shift, uh, let's say, consumer behavior and citizen behavior towards food. Uh, we are running, uh, uh, taking this uh, uh, approach of, uh, let's say, integrated uh, uh, sustainability assessment based on a life cycle thinking uh, approach. We are working with different schools and, and school canteens in Italy. In particularly, we have started with two schools in the province of Ferrara in Italy, in a small town called Cento. Uh, and we are running studies in order to look at the uh, quantification of uh, food waste within schools uh, and the quantification of uh, the environmental impact uh, of uh, a meal and uh, also to uh, look at the environmental impact uh, of uh, a meal uh, considering uh, both the current diet and also the introduction of alternative proteins uh, in uh, the uh, school menu. And, uh, I want to emphasize once again the need to work uh, together with the community and, uh, let's say, starting uh, the work uh, with, the, uh, with the, the municipality in Cento. Uh, we started to work with uh, uh, the um, food operators, uh, with the food caterers, uh, with the dietitians, uh, and, and now we are working together with the Regione Emilia Romagna uh, since the Regione Emilia Romagna is the uh, let's say the uh, uh, administrative center, the policy center, which is uh, uh, coordinating uh, the, the, the development of uh, um, food uh, 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 school canteens uh, uh, at the regional level. And what we are doing is trying to provide them with a simplified tool in order to understand the sustainability of uh, school canteens. Uh, at the local level, so allowing them to have a tool which is uh, that can be used by uh, food providers uh, at the local level uh, in order to have a rapid appraisal about uh, uh, how to improve the sustainability of the system. Again, basing on life cycle uh, thinking. So the uh, the main message I would like to. Uh, importance uh, as uh, many other speakers uh, also highlighted to have uh, 
tools uh, uh, that allow us uh, to clearly understand in a more concrete way what we mean as uh, sustainability, looking at the different pillars and inside the different pillars. And we want to understand the trade-offs in order to be sure that uh, say improving uh, uh, environmental conditions do not mean to decrease uh, uh, any other benefit in economic uh, uh, and social terms. So thank you again to everybody and uh, very happy to uh, have joined and to have, have the chance to contribute to this uh, uh, workshop. Thank you very much, Professor Vitulari. Uh, this comes to the end of the session one. Uh, although we are 30 minutes behind the schedule, uh, let's take a break until 11.35, so just three minutes, but please come back. Uh, we'll resume the next session from 11.35, three minutes uh, after. So see you later on, uh, three minutes after. And we'll resume 11.35. I'll present in session one. Okay, uh, <laughs> I wish everyone is coming back on time, but um,
So, shall we still start the second session? Ms. Mazarena, thank you for taking care of the second session. So please stop, you can start. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Endo. Uh, buongiorno a tutti. E Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank the Italian permanent representation to the UN and, of course, the Secretariat of GIAS for organizing the webinar and for the invitation to moderate this panel, the uh, goal of which is to provide uh, um, experience from the various countries and focus on FAO's recognition of traditional farming systems. I'd like to thank the speakers who have taken the floor so far. Um, my name is Lazarena Lanza, and since 2015, I've been coordinating slow food activities in the Near East and North Africa, following the value chains of products, uh, communities of producers, and traditional cuisine in this part of the Mediterranean. Some very important products uh, in this region are not only shared uh, among the various countries looking onto the Mediterranean, but they're also quoted uh, in the texts uh, um, of the monotheistic religions like the Bible, the Quran, and the Talmud. Uh, and they are uh, figs, uh, olives, uh, honey, pomegranates, uh, just to give you an idea. And this to stress how the elements of uh, historical and cultural and spiritual union and uh, are a lot more numerous uh, than those elements that set us apart and separate us. Uh, and of these, the most important one, of course, is uh, our cuisine, which is the result of connections and exchanges between the various civilizations, so much so that we can speak of a Mediterranean diet with the different local manifestations and expressions. Slow food, as you know, endeavors to restore local gastronomic and agricultural traditions. Today, in synergy with Jihaz, tries to connect communities of consumers with producers in order for them to keep this legacy alive. Now, this is a heritage that's not just translated into the consumption of certain foods. Uh, like vegetables, grains, or, or dairy products, uh, but uh, uh, in the very unique way in which they were produced, uh, and that make these foods uh, healthy, not just for those who consume them, but also for the landscapes uh, that they are part of. Mediterranean diet is therefore uh, important, and not only because it... Um, indeed has uh, beneficial effects on health, uh, but also in or because uh, it is able to link up uh, the landscape uh, processing practices uh, and uh, the traditional values of foods. Uh, and it can represent uh, one of the many points of convergence between uh, um, slow food and jihaz. In this session, we're going to be able to listen to various examples of jihaz sites so who are very specific and that today can narrate their challenges and their experience. Our first speakers will be Ms. Chiara Mattiello and Mr. Uh, Antonio Gaudenzi. Both of them represent uh, jihaz sites in Italy. Ms. Mattiello is a sommelier, uh, she's a brand ambassador in 2012. Um, she established a Verona Autoctona, which um, deals with territorial branding in the area of uh, Verona. She's here with us uh, representing the uh, consortium of Soave. Mr. Gaudenzi instead is uh, in charge of communications and sales, as well as production in the family um, run firm, and today he represents uh, the Jihaz site uh, of Assisi and Spoleto. You have the floor, and you have four minutes each, Ms. Mattiello and Mr. Gaudenzi. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here with us to represent the land and the territory of Soave. And I bring you the greetings of uh, Mr. Gini and all the farmers that are part of this consortium. We became a jihad site in November 2018, and 
We are the 52nd site, uh, although we're the only one so far devoted to the production of grapes exclusively for wine production. This wine is exported uh, in uh, uh, countries throughout the world, and it has thus become an ambassador of Italian wine and for made in Italy products throughout the planet because this wine opened up. Um, Italian wine to uh, markets uh, like the U.S. that we had not known before. Suave is a very hilly landscape, and uh, over the centuries, it did not change very much because of the way that it is structured. It wasn't possible to do anything but practice. Uh, agriculture, Garganiga was brought to Soave by the Romans, the Roman Empire, and this, I think, uh, uh, speaks volumes about the great uh, link that exists uh, between us uh, and the Italian uh, jihad site uh, that produces olive oil, because uh, the um, olive uh, groves and vines were symbols of the Roman Empire, so much so that uh, centurions that were part of the Roman Empire would bring to conquered lands uh, vine shoots and olives. And so olive trees and wine uh, have become the symbols of the greatness of the Mediterranean over the centuries and uh, the variety and uh, the uh, genetic evolution of these species. Also, both wine and olive oil have a religious function. They indeed have a very strong uh, religiosity, and they've become very close. And that's why we're very happy that uh, these are the two sites, uh, Assisi and Soave, that represent uh, Italy throughout the world as FAO jihad sites. And we know that in the European community there is a much debate over wine consumption. And we know that uh, there is much talk about uh, the consumption, but especially the abuse of alcohol and alcoholic beverages in general. But the studies that we've carried out uh, in the consortium uh, speak about the fact that uh, a moderate consumption of wine, at one slash two uh, glasses per day, can actually produce a lot of benefits. Wine is a vasodilator and is rich in uh, uh, polyphenols. Uh, one of them is resveratrol, which was. Uh, thought to be found only in red wine and red grapes, and it's a very strong antioxidant. In 2020, we carried out a study with the University of the Sacred Heart in Piacenza with Professor Bavaresco because we wanted to um, do research into the polyphenols of Garganica, which is a main a, a grape variety in Suave. And uh, we found uh, not just a, a reservatrol, but many polyphenols that were not known. So this is research that we must continue because we might uh, find antioxidants and other substances that could be of great benefit to human health. So since I don't have very much time, I'm afraid I'll have to move to my conclusion and just say that uh, our heritage uh, um, dates back to thousands and thousands of years. It's uh, um, the Garganiga grapes uh, that you see in this landscape of Soave. We've been able to preserve this biodiversity over the centuries. And uh, this, uh, I think, is the key to the future in this uh, environment, uh, which is rural but modern at the same time, because we are a modern agricultural system, and we are a gem to be preserved in the future. Grazie, signora Mattiello. Uh, signor Gaudenzi. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Mattiello. I now give the floor to Mr. Gaudenzi. Here I am. Good morning, and um, thank you for giving me this opportunity. It's always a great pleasure to be here and uh, to speak to you about our land and our territory. It's very close to our heart, and um, we really 
devote a lot of effort to the production of such an important product, which is extra virgin olive oil, which is basically、um, the main constituent of、um, the Mediterranean diet. I'd like to start with my presentation right away because I've got very little time. Right. So, the importance of extra virgin olive oil. We know that、uh, extra virgin olive oil is one of the key elements that、uh, are the basis of the、uh, Mediterranean diet for many different reasons. Well, because there are many different molecules in oil, making oil so important to our health. These three molecules are、um, oleic acid, tocopherols, and vitamin E. So I'm going to make this very brief preamble and polyphenols, of course. Now. Oleic acid, the first of these three molecules, is present in oil and ranges between 50 all the way up to 85 percent. And in this respect, in Italy, we're doing very well because Italian olive oils have a very high average,、uh, if not the highest in the world, around 75 percent in. Of、uh, oleic acid content,、um, this kind of acid has many benefits. It protects、um, a gastric mucosa. It reduces the risk of ulcers. It prevents the formation of stones, and it inhibits、uh, the metabolism of cholesterol. Tocopherols or vitamin E are important antioxidants, and they protect cells from oxidation and inflammation. Which underlie degenerative disease and aging, including, of course, diseases like cancer. Let's move on to polyphenols directly. That、um, uh, the previous speaker alluded to as well. Polyphenols have、uh, an effect on many, many diseases that are very serious, like cancer, diabetes, hypertension. Cardiovascular disorders, infections, aging, and asthma, and these are the, the three large groups of molecules that make oil so good for our health and so beneficial. But the important part that I wanted to stress here is that not all extra virgin olive oils have sufficient percentages of these molecules to make them beneficial. So the necessary condition is for oil to be high quality. Quality of oil is determined by many factors, some of which are related strictly to humans, extraction. Um, harvesting of olives,、uh, olives and、um, storage of olives.、Uh, these are processes that we need to be involved in. Other factors, instead, are related strictly to the territory, and、um, the, we've inherited them, in other words, from those who came before us. So, cultivars. In other words, the quality of olives that are、uh, farmed, and the territory, the land, the soil. And、uh, climate patterns. In this respect,、uh, the area around Assisi Spoleto and the olive groves there、um, are very appropriate because,、uh, as regards the soil part of、uh, the quality that we need in oil, there are many advantages. The first advantage is that in our olive groves, groves we have.、Um, A lot of polyphenols, so our oils have a very, very high degree of polyphenols, and so they're very beneficial to our health. The second important aspect is that of climate,、uh, or rather temperature change. What I mean to say is that between seasons、uh, we have、uh, great variety. In the winter time, we go down to minus ten. And in the summertime, we go up to forty degrees、um, Celsius. As a result of this, parasites like oil flies and、uh, other pests、uh, 
have a very difficult time in surviving, which means that our olives are in excellent state because of the lack of parasites and organic farming doesn't present a problem. Last but not least is the type of soil which is very rocky and has water drainage as a property, so this increases the level of polyphenols. So let me conclude because I'm afraid I've run out of time by thanking you for your kind attention. Grazie mille, signora Mattiello. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Matillo and Mr. Gaudenzi, for your extremely interesting presentations. Unfortunately, we just don't have time to delve into uh, these um, details. But thank you, really, for exploring such important products like wine and uh, oil, which are so crucial to the culture of the Mediterranean at large. Let's move on to the next speaker, Professor Jose Maria Garcia Alvarez Coque. He's an agronomist who obtained a PhD in agrarian economy, and he now teaches of food policies, and he's also the director of the International a group of economy and development at the University of Valencia in Spain. He was also in charge of the historic irrigation system of La Horta in Valencia, uh, which is part of the GIAS system. Professor uh, Garcia Alvarez Coque, you have the floor and you have eight minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that uh, now the screen is uh, being uh, shared, so I'm going to open the presentation. And uh, I want to thank uh, to the EIHS secretary and uh, to the Italian permanent representation for this uh, webinar. And I, I confess that I am really hungry now eh, because I would like to combine the uh, Japanese food with uh, Italian wine and uh, olive oil and all food that we are talking about connected with tradition. So let's travel to another part of the Mediterranean Sea and uh, we go uh, to the eastern part of Spain uh, to one of the systems uh, called uh, Mediterranean Huerta, eh? Mediterranean Garden. Uh, and uh, this is a space of uh, periurban area where uh, you have an uh, agricultural area, uh, cultivated area, uh, which is uh, surrounding urban areas. Eh? So it's a pre-urban area, eh? and it is uh, conformed by a system of channels, very old channels from historical times, Roman, Arabic times, eh? and the southern part of these channels are connecting with a lake. Albufera Lake, which is a freshwater lake. Eh? You see very, very, very thin band, very thin stream, a strip uh, between the lake and the Mediterranean Sea. Well, uh, as I said, it's a very old uh, cultivated landscape, polycultural landscape, and it has a historical water governance uh, system uh, you have a, a way of distributing land uh, with rules uh, which come from very old times, uh, from the uh, 12th century, eh? 12th century, and the community, agricultural community, the community of irrigators is self-governing eh? this system of uh, irrigation. And there is an identity of, uh, of, of urban area eh, uh, of a densely populated area eh, which is uh, uh, connected, uh, feel uh, sensitive to this periurban polycultural system with over 5,000 small family farms, small holdings, and in the southern part, in the lake, uh, artisanal fisheries, eh? also eh, with very, very traditional methods in the Abu Fedal Lake. During the lockdown, eh, during the pandemics, uh, FAO acknowledged 
the resilience of the system. I just put the, the, the link of a video uh, distributed by FAO, and will, uh, I will share this, uh, this link uh, in, the, in the chat. Uh, resilience because uh, so around this system, uh, a solidarity network uh, was built. Uh, and I will, I will try to explain this. But first, let's talk about pandemics and the Mediterranean diet. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I, I want to, to share a list of recent contributions, scientific contributions, provided evidence that Mediterranean diet is associated with lower risk of COVID-19 and related deaths. And also, there are increasing evidences that on the negative side, the lockdown provoked a sedentary behavior in people, but on the positive side, dietary patterns change during pandemics, in, at least in the Spanish society, yeah, in, in our local society, with greater consumption of healthier foods, less consumption of, poor, of food of poor nutritional interest, and also an increase in domestic practice of cooking eh, of fresh products at home. Five contributions of the system to Mediterranean side diet. I want to mention first agrodiversity. Eh? You have lots of, of vegetables cultivated in the area, and some vegetables come from uh, very old times. Uh, some were imported, of course, from America, from uh, from eastern from from from, from eastern regions. Eh? Agrodiversity helps Mediterranean diet. Second, climate adaptability. The irrigation system, eh, self-governed irrigation system, guarantees the use of water. And use of water eh, allows for adaptability to climate impacts. This is good for Mediterranean uh, system and for Mediterranean diet. Third, proximity between the system and urban areas. You have the pictures with local markets, with urban gardens, eh, and all the municipal uh, markets in the, in the city are supplied by local products. Fourth, lifestyle. Uh, okay, we know that uh, new products are adapted to convenience, to the concept of convenience, but uh, here, I think that also farmers and people uh, are trying to keep a lifestyle which gives value to time eh? and to take things quietly and eating well eh? because you have to take your time to eat well. Fifth, five uh, reason, five contribution, cooking. Uh, of course, this is not, uh, I'm, not uh, I'm not a cookie, a cook, uh, I'm not a sommelier, but there are local products, uh, local dish, uh, dishes that you have, uh, uh, you know, based on pumpkins, based on oranges, based on eels, uh, uh, the fish from the lake, and or based on Cyperus esculentus or chata. And of course, I want to mention that the system is the origin of one of the most famous or recognized Spanish dishes, rice, eh? uh, sorry, paella valenciana, eh? which combines elements of the Mediterranean diet. In, this, in the plan, in the action plan, in the, the uh, you know, different administrations are collaborating, regional, university, uh, the municipalities, uh, of the system. And in the Valencia Treaty, there is a food council which joins a forum of nutritionists, farmers, food industry, consumers. And the council is promoting good practices, for example, in school feeding, 
and good practices also in public procurement for social uh, services, hospitals, uh, different residences, uh, etc. Examples of initiatives I uh, mentioned, I, I, I was happy to, to hear the experience in Japan of the calendar. <laughs> so we also have our calendar of seasonal fish from Abu Fera. Another uh, initiative is the Ecotira. Ecotira, no translation, Tira is in Valencian, is row, like a row, row of farmers, farmers which produce organic products from the local area going to the wholesale market, Merca Valencia, the wholesale market, to have uh, the, their deals and, and the different groceries and restaurants can go there to, uh, and, and this uh, con also comes from very old times. And initiatives like controlling food waste by the practice of gleaning, gleaning but this is organized in a social way so the rest of the harvest are taken for social, uh, for social services and food distribution. Sustainable campus, campaigns for promotion, uh, the right to healthy food, and also the recent campaign, Eating Well Saves the Climate. Perspectives. Okay. We have been working at the university level with different uh, stakeholders, and uh, uh, there is a published uh, paper, uh, uh, an experience where, where we assessed different kinds of diets, and the group, which was a disciplinary group, concluded that the advantages of the Mediterranean diet are not only based on nutritional advantages, but also on environment and social attributes, social attributes. So you are, uh, you, you are working with your people. And of course, there are problems. The question remains on the future of small holdings. There is a pressure, urban pressure eh, still. And uh, will, will the small holdings manage to survive in the future? Because you can have very healthy diets, but uh, can be supplied by big companies. Eh? So can you combine the social perspective and the nutritional perspective and the environmental perspective? And I want to add that digital technologies are improving the position of many small holdings and their links with proximity, with local markets. Eh? So this is an interesting um, development in the, the, the area of the GHS of the Huerta de Valencia, the irrigation, the irrigated system uh, of the Huerta de Valencia. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I, I was happy to be here. Grazie uh, mille, Thank you, Professor Garcia Alvarez Coque, for the very passionate presentation about this um, example of resilience and solidarity that happened during the COVID outbreak. Let's now move on to the next speaker right away. I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Hatem Zitoumni, who works uh, as an assistant uh, at uh, the University of Gafsta in Tunisia, and he's also chair of the Association for the protection of um, the Medina of uh, Gafsa. Since 2011, this has been the association, the local association uh, responsible for the conservation of uh, the GS site of Gafsa. Its main uh, uh, interests are technologies and uh, agricultural practices and the conservation of the Medina and Gafsa. Professor Azituni, you have the floor and you have eight minutes. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the um, FAO, I mean, GS Secretary for giving us this uh, opportunity. I would like today to talk about, I mean, one, I mean, GS site in Tunisia, it's the 
historical oasis of Gaza. Uh, I will talk, my presentation will be, I mean, entitled Resilience, Climate Change Adaptation and Local Diets in Gafsa Historic Oasis in Tunisia. Now, this will be my outline. Simply, I will locate then, give you an idea about the food habits there, then explain such things. And then at the end, I mean, I will end up with some, I mean, adaptation measures that uh, are, I mean, adopted by the farmers uh, here. I mean, this is a map of the oasis uh, of Gafsa. Uh, I mean, the oasis of Gafsa is something like 2005, uh, 2,500, I mean, hectares with a small nucleus, I mean, of 750 hectares, that is the historical oasis, and that was at the origin of the expansion of the whole oasis. It was, I mean, uh, recognized as a GIA site in 2011. I would simply start by this uh, quote, which I like, diet derives from the Greek, I mean, dietia, meaning a way of life. It's not a nutritional model, but a phenomenon encompassing food production, marketing, consumption, conviviality, ritual, and symbology of the Mediterranean. And I believe that, I mean, this one applies very well to the oasis of Gafsa, where, I mean, uh, their diet is mainly based on cereals, which is a staple ingredient, mainly wheat and barley. You know, we, we eat two types or two dishes of couscous. We call couscous motion and vegetable couscous. Uh, now, the point is that these cereals, they are not produced in the oasis. They all come from the north of Tunisia. Uh, the same thing, I mean, we have another I mean, dish, basically flour, olive oil, water, sugar, and nuts. Uh, and uh, the, the, I mean, the nuts are simply produced locally, yet, I mean, the cereals are not produced here. So there was right from the beginning a problem of food security in this area. Uh, The other, I mean, type is the question of uh, legumes, chickpeas, lentils, and all of these, which most of them also come from the, the north of uh, Tunisia. So well, you may ask, what does the oasis of Gafsa produce? Simply it produces, I mean, olives, olive oil, dates, and vegetables. Okay? And all these products are being traded with the north of Tunisia. Okay? In, a, in, a, in terms of exchanging these products. That's why, I mean, we move to the question of uh, vegetables. If you look at the, I mean, the photo in the middle, that's what you find in the bag of a common man who goes to the market every morning to buy, I mean, his food. So it's mostly vegetables. Right? So the diet here is rather, I mean, a vegetable food, a vegetable based, I mean, uh, uh, diet. And most of the dishes, I mean, that we eat are mainly based on, uh, I mean, uh, vegetables. Uh, this brings me to the question of drawing a certain table. What is the ingredients that are locally produced and the ingredients that are not locally produced. And you see the, the, the cereals, the legumes, and the meat itself is not locally produced, but is what is produced, dates, olives, olive oil, nuts, vegetables, and corn. So one characteristic of this area is that meat is considered as a secondary ingredient and cereals and legumes as exotic ones. Okay? Very simple, they are exotic because the population here has to travel north to get such things. Uh, uh, so this question of shortage of resources has encouraged communication with other communities to create a combination between production and commercial uh, 
activities. Now, as a mechanism of adaptation, the local population, I mean, will develop great storage capacities for their products, uh, because they need to take them, I mean, up to the north. Uh, and the population has also has to develop techniques to reduce the demand for animal-based food, I mean, products, and move to what we call plant-based uh, proteins. For this reason, one thing was introduced to the oasis of GAPS, it's the introduction of corn. It was introduced because of its high fiber content, because of the, its root mass, which considers a lot, um, I mean, con which contains considerable organic matter for the soil. It's good for animal feed. And it's best to rotate with the forage culture. And it's already a niche product that we find in the oasis. Okay? And when it comes to the diet, it's easily adapted to cooking with the vegetables. Now, this inclination, I mean, led to develop two corn varieties are being naturalized and now they have i mean locally developed the seeds right now we come to the question of i mean the question of the seed sovereignty with the oasis especially with vegetables okay because that's i mean very important for them and most of the locally, I mean, developed seeds are climate resi resilient than the um, I mean, generic commercial varieties. Okay? Uh, and um, the farmers, they develop a small seed exchange networks and banks to promote, I mean, their local agrobiodiversity and land uh, races, both within the oasis and within the other Tunisian oasis, I mean, deep and uh, I mean, deeper in the south and in the east of Tunisia. Uh, one more thing is that you have a fair competition between the farmers to produce, I mean, the most enduring seeds. Right? You know that farmers, they don't want to give, I mean, what they call, I mean, the male seed. Right? This is something that they want, they want to exchange between, I mean, within their community. Now, these seeds, they play a key role in increasing, I mean, the dietary diversity in uh, the area. Now, these questions of, I mean, adaptations measures, it's this demand side, increasing proportion of plant-based foods in diets, particularly vegetables and replacing meat with more efficient protein, I mean, sources. This is very important in a small area like the oasis of Gafsa, because this reduces the pressure on land and water, and thus the vulnerability of the climate, okay, and puts limitations on the area where this is the this is an area where the the average parcel is less than two hectares. So land is very important, uh, and the 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 consumption of water also is very important. Excuse me. Uh, Mr. Atem. Uh... Yes, these are some of the these are some of the products. Another, I mean, another adaptation measure is the question of manure management, right? And you have this the question of, uh, I mean, uh, conserving the soil. The soil, I mean, uh, organic. I mean. Uh, uh, quality. Uh, now, the other one is the question of cultural values. This is an area where the population is an, an indigenous community. Historically speaking, they have, I mean, been uh, a community that has always resisted and it has its own, I mean, adaptations, I mean, measures. Uh, uh, they suffered a lot of uh, risks uh, and they want simply to have, I mean, their culture, 
to have their own, I mean, culturally sensitive, I mean, risk analysis, okay, to better, I mean, uh, their life and to uh, adopt. These are some of the fruits produced in the oasis, uh, and thank you very much. Grazie a lei, Thank you, uh, thank you, Professor Zitumi, for this interesting example of an adaptation of local agricultural practices and uh, the solidarity and collaboration that um, took place. I do have a question concerning the grains um, that are no longer being uh, grown in spite of the traditional diet in spite of the fact that your traditional diet, I was saying, is largely composed by traditional grains. I was especially thinking about the importance of traditional oases, which unfortunately seem to be disappearing, but they do represent the most incredible example of uh, resilience and agroforestry systems. It would be important, I think, to say something more about these systems because they exist and thanks to ingenious uh, systems managing water resources. It's a multi-layer, multi-stratum system. So you have uh, palm trees and then at the highest level, then you have pomegranates and uh, in the intermediate level and at the lowest level you have forage and vegetables which are life-giving, of course, and which allow for resilience in the oases. I just wanted to uh, underscore the importance of these models and say how difficult it is in some cases to actually retrieve some of these practices and um, cultivate certain crops that are so crucial to the entire system. Let's move on to the next speaker now, Ms. Uh, Susan Luzio. Susan Luzio. graduated from the University of Porto. She's a project manager um, who works for DRAT. Uh, um, DRAT is an organization that was uh, responsible for the um, candidacy of Barroso as a site uh, to the GS system. Ms. Luzio is especially in charge of the communications concerning the GS site of Barroso. Um, you have the floor, Ms. Lucia. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for having us. The opportunity to present uh, the Barroso GS uh, traditional knowledge and local diet. I will try to keep on schedule. So, um, the Barroso region is located in the northern Portugal, uh, and in administrative terms, it covers two of the six municipalities that compose the Alto Tamga, which is a Nut 3. The municipalities that compose uh, Barroso are Boutiques and Montalegre. Barroso territory is a mountainous area with a general aspect of one compact mass of highlands and plateaus separated by large depressions and crossed by many rivers and streams. Uh, a large part of the municipality of Montalegre is within the only national park in Portugal called Peneda Jerez. The management of the meadows take advantage of the natural topographic features and of the physiologic cycles of the vegetation, as you can see in the image. Uh, it is one of the main and ancient knowledge systems that is still present, being vital for the agrarian system of Barroso. Farms are usually small on average, and agroclimatic conditions have fostered uh, collective farming habits between residents, which are based on mutual help and solidarity. 
communitarianism is one of the most typical values and customs of Barroso, closely associated with the rural practices and collective living of its needs to adapt to the environment. It is a form of rural organization circumscribed to the territory and based on deep sense of solidarity and cooperation between neighbors. In Portugal, examples of this community organization can only be found today in some of the more remote mountain areas in the northern region. Among the communitarian activities and customs are the creation of the communitarian mill and oven and uh, uh, the clearing of the paths and irrigation uh, channels. In Barroso, the farming and the food are a part of an economy of subsistence. The soils are poor and thin and have restrict farming development and extensive grazing land is very, very important. The land structure is typically of private small holdings, as you can see in one of the pictures. Uh, it's arable lands and meadows. Agricultural crops are mostly based on annual crops, cereals and vegetables. In addition to permanent pastures used for cattle grazing, the region has a number of agricultural productions where annual and forage crops prevail this way providing a very important part of human food and animal feed, especially the rye, potatoes, turnips, beans, and cabbages. In arable land is used an annual crop rotation system, including fallow period, during which the land is used for livestock grazing. The farming system is an agro livestock and each farmer produces different crops and even creates different animal species. Grazing is extensive with animals spending much of the time outdoors. This type of grazing uses both permanent pastures reserved for their grazing and also for poor pastures filled with vegetation, which cover very significant extensions of the Barroso territory. The main cereal of Barroso is rye, grown on the land with poor soil conditions, usually in a two-year crop rotation, alternating with the potato. The rye is cultivated for human consumption and used for the baking and also for animal feed. Indeed, the eating habits of the populations have been strongly associated for centuries with the need of subsistence and have evolved with processing of various products such as smoked meat. The vegetable production is resumed to potato, turnip, cabbage, and squash, which are grown in the mountains and valleys, and the method of production has not changed significantly over the time. These products are well suited to the soil and climate of the region, it's also very common to find several types of beans in the Barroso cuisine. These vegetables are used as side dishes to the meat and also used in the soups, which are very popular in the region. In the region of Alto Tambra, which is where Barroso is located, are produced several products traditionally found in the Mediterranean uh, diet, such as the olive oil, which is the main seasoning in the most of the dishes, including boiled vegetables, salads, and stews. The aromatic herbs are quite popular, such as thyme, basil, rosemary, parcel, and so on. In the daily diet, diet is also common to use bread, even as side dish or appetizer, together with olive oil, wine, also produced in the Barroso. Honey is one of the productions in the upward trend. In the municipality of Boutiques and Montalegre, there are 183 beekeepers registered, and it was awarded to Barroso Honey the produ protected denomination of origin, which reinforces the recognition of its quality, constituting an important complement to the agricultural uh, family economy. The honey has numerous uses in Barroso, especially in regional cuisine and also regarding uh, health issues. 
Gastronomy is one of the strongest identity factors of Barroso culture, and it's deeply rooted in the daily culture. The small productions constitute a subsistence production, and the products such as vegetables, aromatic herbs, honey, and bread have always been basis to the Barroso diet. It is important to mention that the bread is traditionally made in wood fire ovens. In some villages, it's still cooked in a large community oven where two or three families come together and bake the bread. This way, the expenses for the firewood are split. In the climate of Barroso, uh, the climate of Barroso favors the farming and of this type of products linked to the Mediterranean diet favoring the integration of these products within the usual population's day-to-day -day consumption practices. The practices used in the agriculture and confection of the products do not include preservative food additives, being the products the most natural possible from the land to the table. Thank you. Yeah. Grazie a lei, signora Luzio, per questa bellissima presentazione. Ho l'impressione che lei ha toccato tutti i prodotti di cui parlavo. Grazie molto per aver toccato i prodotti che ho parlato. Il tempo è veramente tiranno. Uh, passiamo immediatamente uh, al nostro... Uh, I'm to, to leave the, the... I'm sorry. It's um, the green button at the bottom. It says share screen. Yeah, that's it. No, no, I'm sorry, my mistake. Thank you. So our next and last speaker is um, in the session, that is, it is Professor Chandeli, who teaches at the Academy of Agricultural Sciences in China. He's published eight books and over a hundred articles, academic articles, disseminated internationally, like um, the Journal of Food Studies. So he also has a lot of experience in terms of jihaz and uh, is a member of the expert committee on. Uh, at the uh, national um, jihaz uh, in China and uh, is uh, also an expert uh, of the globally important agricultural heritage system. Mr. Li, you have the floor. You have eight minutes, maybe a little bit less actually, because we really have to wind up very quickly and move on to the next session. Thank you. Thank you very much, moderator. In order to save time, I would like to use Chinese. This is a very important theme when we are talking about the food, healthy diet. In China, there are eight types of cuisines. If we divide these eight cuisines into detailed cuisines in different provinces, in different local areas, we could find healthy foods and diets. Now, let me come to the background when we are talking about food and agriculture systems. A lot of problems were mentioned. And the moderator mentioned we issued a report last year at the UNCFC talking about the food system material 2030. There are a series of problems. The first one is the increasing food security, um, diabetes, and uh, there are 690 million hunger people. If we put all those with a poor nutrition, the figure might be increased to 200, uh, t 2 billion people. Currently, the biodiversity is decreasing including the types of foods is decreasing. 
We have a feeling compared with the before. The taste of the food we're having is different from those in the past. We also are facing food insecurity because of time constraint. I'm not going to elaborate on them one by one. You know, in China, we have GS sites compared with other countries. This is a big number. We have carried out some studies. Within the traditional wisdoms of Aegeus, the traditional wisdoms were embodied in different stages, and the links of production, resource management, and consumption. The Aegeus is very conducive to solve a lot of problems we are facing, which is also realize help realize the four betters: a better production, better nutrition, a better environment, and a better life. And next, in combination of Chinese history, I'm allowed to expand on the points. The first thing we found is that the diverse, varied, and abundant seas and gem plus just is a compound and recycling system. For example, in Zhejiang Province, a developed province. There is a dike and a fish pond system. Trees, mobile trees, were planted along the pond, and、uh, the worms, silkworms, will eat the leaves. The feces will be dumped into the pond, and the fish will eat the feces of the silkworm. So this is just a basic picture. So in Yunnan Hani Rice Terrace. We have more than 100 local varieties of red rice in Honghe Hani Rice Terraces of Yunnan Province, which can promote species and varieties diversifications and biodiversity conservation. This picture shows a study we carried out in Anxi, Fujian Province. We have found that Anxi area produces a tea. But the production of the tea is closely related to the ecosystem around the tea production area. So, in these GS systems, we can find a large variety of foods. The production of the GS concerns a whole life cycle, covering processing. Let's take tea for example. We have the choice of the site of the tea. And the establishment of irrigation, the drainage, ecological planting, and the management of the soil and the water management, pest and disease prevention and control, these all these activities are showing some traditional wisdoms. These are the four pictures covering several stages. The lower right corner is the traditional production process and processing process of teas. From the environmental perspective, we emphasize the combination of nature and nurture, nature and a human being, the philosophy of the harmony between man and nature.、Uh, Franklin Hiram King is a soil scientist. One hundred years ago, in 1911, he wrote a book, Farmers of Forty Centuries. We translated that book into Chinese. We are using this book to guide and promote a more environmentally friendly ecological agriculture, and farming process, efficient resources recycling. We also found that there are a lot of scientific management and distribution resources in GS, such as the management of soil. This picture shows the 14th report of HLPE. Within this report. Where it's highlighted with the red ink is the Hani Terrace of Rice. Next one is Longji Terrace, which is located in Guangxi Province. We used these two good examples into the HLP 14th report. Of course, we are using these resources and types and forms to do the GS. We have a Hani Rice Terrace. The organic matter. Including phosphate and other nutrients, compared with the green standards of the nation, of course the indicators here are much higher. 
Fourthly, we provide a healthy diet and a rich nutrition. In the GS sites, the products produced there are with natural flavor, fresh, and with a high standard. Therefore, foods in these areas are characterized with being healthy, tasty, diversified, nutritive, local, and unique. These health diets are conducive to prevent malnutrition or obesity because these health diets emphasize on balanced intake of nutritional elements. There are 15 GS themed restaurants open, being opened in Huzhou. That means all the dishes and the cuisines from these 15 places are collected here. Let's look at the picture. These are the special products or cuisines. All these cuisines are made with Chinese ingredients and produced with Chinese procedures. The first one is dried fish, is Qingtian, Zhejiang Province. The second one is the one on the right upper corner, is a honey sauce comprising 30 ingredients. In Xinhua County of Jiangsu Province, they have their own ingredients. And beautiful, healthy foods produced with the ingredients. This is impressive. This is the honey rice terrace I was talking about. This is called the Long Street Banquet. There is a huge species of diversity in Yunnan. So in Yunnan Province, there is a habit and a culture. At a specific festivity season, the dishes are made by different families. And then they present the dishes on the long table on the street. This is a good practice. If we have a good food, we can have a better and a happy life. So first of all, I believe this is closely related to beautiful landscapes, which can attract a lot of tourists to see the scenery and enjoy the beautiful cuisine. I listed. Some pictures. These pictures are taken by professional photographers. Are very beautiful. This is Honghe Rice Terrace, and this is the rice and the fish system. This is the rice, plant, ducks, and the fish system. This is the GS the 2018 promotion picture, and this is the mulberry tree and the fish pond in Huzhou. This picture is an activity of production in the northern part of China. The last one is the jasmine tea system. So, in the Jiaz site, we have a traditional culture and historical stories, attracting a large number of tourists and visitors. They love these places. Employment was also promoted. We carried several studies into the sites. We found that 50% of women are participating in relevant activities of production in these sites. We talked about all the advantages and the four benefits. Although China has 15 years, ranking first in the world, but it's still far from enough compared with people's expectation for a better life and the requirements for the transition and transformation of the food and agricultural system. Therefore, we needed to work harder to establish more GSEs as well as the application in the globe. Thank you very much. That's all from me. Grazie, grazie a lei, signor. Thank you, Mr. Li, for this、uh, very interesting presentation. I feel hungry now. I worked up an appetite. We're three minutes behind. I'm afraid. At one, the interpreters will、um, finish their interpretation time. So I ask you to please be patient and wait for the end of the last、um, session to take your break and show the videos that、uh, were meant to be projected. So now, we run out of time, and within thirty minutes, we have we will lose the interpretation service. So we have finished the seminar within 30 minutes. So I'd like to ask the rest of the speakers.
to abide by. Could you please cooperate to, to shorten your presentation time to seven minutes? I'm sorry to interfere with the moderator too. And due to the interconnection problem with the Professor Enrique, I'm going to moderate the free session. So without any break, we need to get into the automatically to the session three. So first speaker, sorry, uh, uh, Ms. Nazaren, I'm sorry to interfere, but uh, <laughs> this is quite a urgent situation. Thank you very much for your mo good moderation and speakers and mo moderation too. So let's get into the uh, third session. First speaker is uh, Professor Mohammad Bakri from Morocco. He is working for National Agency for Development of Oasis and Urban Tree Area, Andozwa. So, Professor Mohamed Bakri, I'm sorry to ask you seven minutes uh, presentation time to guarantee the good quality of the question. Please, Professor. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I'll try to uh, stick to that timing. And I hope uh, you can all hear me, especially the interpreters. Yes, the interpreters can hear the speaker. <clears throat> Fine. So I presume you're hearing me. So I shall begin with this uh, presentation in this very important seminar. I'd like to point out uh, from the start that <clears throat> the fact that GIAS has been repeated in many statements only stresses how important this uh, process is. And the GIAS is indeed in Morocco too a means of enhancing visibility and an opportunity as well for sustainable development. So with your permission, my presentation will focus on four key points. The first is on the agricultural production system in Morocco, which is an ancestral rustic system, and it produces uh, healthy food. And to uh, enrich uh, the Mediterranean Basket, I'd like to talk about some of our products. For example, the uh, argan oil, uh, which uh, you're probably familiar with and you doubtless know about the culinary and health virtues of the argan tree with the recent International Day of uh, the argan tree. And the second is our GS approach, which uh, is an approach which fits um, w within the dovetailing of man, nature, and it stresses the importance of um, the GS um, hallmark, which has become especially important recently with the consequences of the pandemic, demonstrating the importance of always remaining close to nature and close to our culture and our agriculture, and given our history, and given the climatic problems which we face in Morocco, we have huge potential here which would make the country eligible for, as GS, for GS sites. Now we have two already in Morocco, one which was inscribed in 2018 at Mansour and the also, um, and that, that incidentally is related to the argan tree, and we have two more sites in the pipeline, the, the uh, irrigation system um, in one area, and uh, Tasnacht, which is also very important uh, for uh, livestock in the oasis region, and then there is a further one which we are considering submitting. Now, as I said at the start, I wanted to enrich the basket of products in the Mediterranean. I wanted to, to speak about the argan tree, which recently enjoyed an international day uh, of the argan tree, celebrated on the 10th of May of each year. 
and this is uh, uh, something which uh, acknowledges the efforts to safeguard this universal heritage. So good practices and traditional practices in this uh, and, uh, in this area and around this product warrant a great deal of attention. And our country is proud to contribute very meaningfully uh, through this product, which is of great importance for humanity. As I said, it's a typically Mediterranean system which has made it possible for centuries to produce uh, valuable uh, services for the local community, very varied production, tailored to the difficult circumstances in terms of climate in the area. It's also allowed us to have uh, niche products which have now reached most international market markets. I'm sure you now are well aware of what argan oil for nutrition and indeed for skin care. And it's um, becoming uh, very important internationally as a result. Now, the argan forest is a complex space with exceptional natural curiosity where socio-cultural and economic uh, systems have developed which are very original, uh, centered around the argon tree which has remarkable uh, resilience to uh, acute water shortage as well as extreme temperatures. Mm. It um, is a tree which has a, a root system which is ten times deeper than other trees. And now this is also an area which is rich in tradition and the culture, the monuments of the region and above all the lifestyle which is very much rooted in the life of the population, many of whom work uh, in the area of extracting argan oil. And it's also... Uh, a very ingenious form of adaptation in terms of water resource management, which is very important in these areas. Here you see a very simplified graphic of water collection in these areas. In the knowledge, interruption from the ch chair. Could you summarize? We will okay. do some uh, remedy one action minute. to post your video yes. later on in a different Donc, je, je, je vais aller plus vite. Donc. Well, I'll go even more quickly, says the speaker. So these are very varied sites in terms of landscape. And on uh, my third point, I wanted to say that this is a system which fits very well with national policy and international policy in terms of sustainable development. Mm. And I'll... Uh, also point out that we've just um, uh, also um, developed biosphere reserves with huge uh, resources. I'll have to go through all this too quickly. And I'll just uh, let you uh, travel through this presentation, which I'll leave with you. You have the mapping of the areas as well as the specificities of the endemic species in this area. We are uh, the second highest country in terms of biodiversity in the Mediterranean, many endemic species in these regions. I just want to say one short word uh, to close by talking about agricultural, agricultural diversity. And there are species here which have adapted to the circumstances, and I'm thinking of animals in particular. Speaker's frozen. Okay, thank you very much. Um, with the local time, I must ask the next speakers to uh, present. Um, so, next speaker is uh, Xi'an, Italian uh, Agency for Mediterranean Diet Study. Mr. Roberto Capone, uh, could you please prepare the presentation? I'm for Professor Mohamed Bakri. I'm sorry, very sorry to say, could you uh, close the, yeah. We take some remedial action to post your video later on in some way. So, Mr. Kaplan, please. 
sorry, six minutes, and we'll take a remedial action. Sì, buongiorno. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to very kindly thank his, um, Her Excellency, the Ambassador Vincenzo Lomonaco, for having convened this important event. Uh, I have uh, the um, honor to represent uh, an international organization called the CHIHAM that um, comprises 13 countries from the southern and the northern shore of the Mediterranean. I'm going to have to cut back on my presentation to allow for the last speaker to deliver his presentation. So I'm just going to move on to the conclusions of what I had prepared to facilitate everybody's task. In light of everything that was said about food systems and the Mediterranean diet, uh, what I wanted to bring to your attention is the, uh, the witness uh, that FAO and uh, SHEHAM, uh, the center that um, I chair, um, and the work that they've done since 2010 on the sustainability of, uh, of food production and consumption with a special reference to the sustainability of diets and the sustainability of food systems in the Mediterranean using as a case study, the Mediterranean diet, after the knowledge gained during many international uh, workshops and visits, attention was focused uh, on uh, the Mediterranean diet as being not just healthy but especially sustainable because it reduces the overall impact on ecosystem and uh, raises the awareness of people as to the economic, social, and cultural aspects. Following this approach, the Mediterranean diet has... Uh, been looked upon as a model of sustainable diet with many um, sustainable factors uh, that change according to country. And these were actually uh, summarized in a um, slide that I'd prefer, uh, any, uh, that I'd prepare that shows uh, benefits uh, on health, for example, the prevention of chronic disease, non-communicable disease, um, benefits, uh, also because of the low environmental impact, uh, the richness in biodiversity, appreciation of the value and meaning of biodiversity. We have cases from all over the world, from China, Japan, Portugal, and Spain. And uh, the also high or the high social and cultural value of food, the recognition of mutual respect, and high social inclusion. However, data has shown that the adherence to this kind of model seems to be declining, especially in Mediterranean countries. One of the main challenges that seems to, or seem to be involved when it comes to this nutritional model is the lack of information and significant data, especially in the southern shore of the Mediterranean. That seems to be the case. So, of course, uh, we need to step up the sustainable production on both shores of the Mediterranean. In so doing, we will be able to provide uh, additional scientific evidence and data in order to better understand how to bridge the gap between consumption and production of sustainable food. In this context, uh, I think that uh, the GHAS program is extremely important in relation to what we've said thus far, so as to develop new strategies and um, uh, innovative solutions and share experiences. And um, in January, the CM, together with FAO and the Union for the Mediterranean, um, signed an MOU on the sustainability of food systems in the Mediterranean. And uh, attached therein is a, a program of work which also provides for the establishment uh, of a platform in order to uh, respond to the needs of regional and local uh, requirements, considering the multidimensional 
aspect uh, of the diet and the countries, both on the northern and southern shore of the Mediterranean. In line with the UN SDGs, the platform uh, seeks to reinforce regional efforts and collaboration and the involvement of all stakeholders. In conclusion, I would like to stress that our organization intends to continue its activities to step up the sustainability of food and diets with spe special focus on the Mediterranean diet at the different levels. And this through training, research, and international cooperation in synergy with the many institutes that GHAM includes, but also with the governments that are sharing this journey with a view to um, achieving sustainable development for me the Mediterranean. I hope that one concrete um, result of this webinar is the possibility of establishing a network of universities and international agencies and organizations around these uh, uh, items and issues. I'd like to conclude now and thank everyone, including the interpreters who have made all this possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kapoor. It is our pleasure to further promote our collaboration. Thank you very much. The final speaker is Mr. Katsuyoshi Ishii from Ishika Prefecture. He is the Director General of Agriculture Department of Ishika Local Government. He will present the case of Noto Satayama Jia system and local food system. So please go ahead and speak in Japanese. I'm sorry for the limited time. My name is Ishii. I am uh, from Ishikawa Prefecture. Today, I would like to introduce our initiatives to realize sustainable agriculture and communities based on that in Noto's peninsula. Uh, we are based here in Ishikawa Prefecture. The Noto Peninsula is located here, uh, sticking out to the Sea of Japan. And when I say Satoyama, Satoyumi, it indicates to the, uh, it designates the, to the local traditional landscape and coastal scape that we can find, uh, we can find in Noto Peninsula. I'm sorry, the speaker's voice is, um, is breaking up. Internet connection seems to be um, not sufficient. So, um, I'm explaining about the Satoyama, Sato Umi, uh, Umi uh, the local uh, landscape and seascape in the Noto Peninsula, which consists of terraced rice paddies, um, the forest irrigation ponds, um, and where uh, local activities like salt making are um, undertaken. We are blessed with the natural uh, landscape filled with rivers, uh, coast, area forest and uh, we have distinct four seasons. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the speaker's voice is completely inaudible. I'm, the voice is not coming in. I'm sorry, this is Mr. Endo speaking, the, um, that the voice is not audible. The voice of uh, the speaker is not audible. Please uh, c come closer to the microphone. So I was talking about the four seasons uh, with uh, uh, humid and hot summer and snowy and cold uh, winter, uh, which is adapted to the fermentation um, uh, activities like sake and soy sauce and miso paste making. Our agricultural and forestry and uh, fishing activities are closely connected to uh, local festivals and uh, rituals. Furthermore, we have 
uh, the irrigation canals and the rice paddies that are forming biodiversity uh, where we are creating the habitat for even endangered species. The terraced rice paddies are world famous and uh, it is uh, facing the coastal area. We have the traditional uh, bamboo fence fences that pre protect the houses and structures from the strong sea wind. We are also facing with some challenges today because in Noto Peninsula area, we are seeing the aging population of farmers and young people flocking to city centers. This is uh, creating the problem of succession of farmland. In Ishikawa Prefecture, we are taking measures uh, to uh, solve this situation and we have uh, requested uh, the certification by FAL of our area in Noto Peninsula. In June 2011, Noto's Satoyama Satoumi area was designated as GS. I'd like to talk a bit more about the initiatives in our area. In Ishikawa Prefecture, we are financially supporting the agricultural um, promotion. We have two different funds for these purposes. The first fund I'd like to talk about is called Ishikawa Agricultural Entry Support Fund for starting farmers and corporations who would like to start farming activities in our area. Since the recognition of our area, uh, we had seen uh, quite a brand recognition and Im improvement of our brand image of our agricultural produce. I'm sorry. Could you speed up your uh, presentation so that we can finish in time? And you could perhaps come up uh, with a conclusion already. Forty-two companies inside and outside of Ishikawa are using uh, these schemes. We also have created a special school, a farmer's school, for, uh, to educate future farmers. The second uh, fund that I'd like to talk about uh, that the prefecture has set up is called Ishikawa Satoyama Promotion Fund to come up with new products and services based on our local produce. Uh, I'd like to give you some examples of the product that uh, utilized this scheme, the buckwheat noodles uh, that are grown in Noto. And also, uh, the restaurants in Noto area have come up with five different type of lunch boxes for the tourists who visit this area. We are also creating uh, the local branding of our uh, produce, such as these. We are learning from the Italian movement of slow food and slow tourism, and we are coming up with a uh, Ishikawa style slow tourism. A farmhouse in district in Noto uh, village is a good example. It's called Shunran no Sato, and this village is used uh, by a overseas tourists as well as um, a, a high school students who visit this area, uh, it is becoming an important tourism uh, financial source of the region. Finally, um, I would like to make an announcement that this coming fall, uh, we are planning um, to co commemorate the 10th anniversary of Noto Satoyama Satoyumi as GS, and as such, we are planning an international forum. We will make sure that this uh, forum is accessible as a webinar online. I hope that you'll be interested in participate in this meeting planned this autumn. 
Thank you very much for your attention. Actually, thank you very, very much. It was so good to hurry you up in this way. <laughs> and uh, now this comes to the end of the whole presentation. And um, we, today we have learned a lot of presentation, very interesting presentation, which uh, stirs up our insights to connect a dietary activity, dietary pattern to sustainability and social and economic and cultural impacts and even the uh, agriculture production side. And based on study, we would like to further develop our, our ideas and how to um, address the issue of sustainability and nutrition in the big, very big umbrella of healthy and sustainable diet, which connect uh, dietary pattern and production. And this program is also working toward to shed more light on the uh, traditional diets existing in the GS site and how this could be contributed to the promotion of the GS sustainability. On this occasion, I would like to thank Italian Embassy, Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the support of GS program and all the presenters from the different countries and all the moderators as well and the interpretation team which uh, accepted our uh, few minutes uh, extension and FAO <coughs> meeting service team and if a video and audio service team I would like to extend all the uh, uh, collaborators for this webinars and our result on the recording will be uploaded in somewhere and I will let you know and I also make a summary of this seminar and also upload in the FAO GS uh, website. And thank you very much, very once again, very much for your cooperation. And see you in the future in the similar type of webinars. Thank you very, very much. And this will be the end of the uh, session. Thank you. Adibiraj, Ciao. Ciao.